thank you first of all for letting me talk to you today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> um, how's the tour been going? It's been my favorite tour I've ever been on. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Why's it really that? has. A few things come together all at once. One is is simply a certain age that we've achieved, <laughs> in a certain era in the band where uh, everyone's married. Two of the guys are fathers. I'm not. But and uh, so we've all got this. We're a little bit more mature and grateful now to still be doing it this long into uh, playing music. Uh, then there's the fact that we made the record specifically for it to be fun to play live, and we succeeded at that at least. And we're having a really good time playing these songs. Uh, the next thing that came together was we wanted to do this epic production, and it actually worked. We really thought it was going. I, Last month there were several times where I just thought this is not going well. This is this is not going to work. We're gonna, we're not going to have anything. We're trying to do this big thing. It's going to not work, and we're not going to have anything. But it actually all came came together in the final hour. And lastly, I have my wife with me. The opening band is comprised of some of my best friends, and our crew are all great guys, including our drivers. Everybody we've. Uh, you know, got the the best group of people we've ever had together. So, uh, you know, like being sick or the fact that my house got broken into the other day doesn't do much to diminish how wonderful all this is for me. Uh, thankfully, they didn't steal much. They only got my wife's laptop, and her laptop was really crappy and old, anyways. And she got a new one, and she's excited about that. So it's all good. It's, <laughs> it's like a blessing. Yeah, I think that whoever broke into our house were probably pretty disappointed. <laughs> like, who's this? Who's this weirdo? <laughs> Why is it, you, all you have is records. <laughs> they didn't take any of my records, I thought. That was a poor decision on their part. I had some good records. Uh, well, still do. But <laughs> anyhow, yeah, yeah, it really is my, my favorite favorite tour I've ever been on so far. Right it really on. is. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'd love to talk a little bit about On Soul. Yep. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you, because what really struck me about it is when I bought it, the cover is the first thing that I saw. Yeah. And I haven't really seen anything about what that means, so I'd love to hear about it. Well, I made the cover, so I suppose you're asking the right person. I worked with my father-in-law to do it. He's really uh, capable with, well, he does graphic design for a living, so he's really good with Photoshop. And I was in Missouri at the time. He, he lives in Texas, and we were just emailing stuff back and forth. And, yeah, it does have some significance. Of course, the little cross on his lapel, and... Uh, the whole idea of Odd Soul is loosely related to our upbringing. All through my adolescence, I was really, what's the word, obsessed with charismatic Christian culture, um, with, with being, I was trying, I wanted to be, uh, I guess I, I kind of thought that I was supposed to be a prophet or like an evangelist and that I was going to heal the sick and raise the dead eventually. There was a time where I genuinely believed that that was my call, you know, that I was supposed to be like, you know, if they were still writing the Bible, like I'd be getting into it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> auditioning to make, make it, maybe get my own book, you know, the book of Darren. Um, and it was pretty high expectations and standards to put on a little 14 year old kid and they ended up really breaking me down. I eventually got kind of went through this meltdown, especially whenever there was some sex scandal in my church, and all of this happening at once caused me to feel really disillusioned and frustrated. And then there was this journey of after that, after that disillusionment, returning and separating the good parts of my upbringing from the bad and realizing it wasn't all garbage, but it wasn't all perfect. And also that perhaps those expectations that I was putting on myself were a bit unreasonable you know and so then at the age of 29 I find myself still wrestling with a lot of the philosophical and uh, theological problems that I had exactly when I was 14 and I feel not that much further along in that regard I feel further along in some ways I'm a better drummer for sure I was 14 and I'm married now and I'm you know like made some music videos and all like, like yeah. I've done some stuff but then when it comes to some of these big questions I feel equally stumped and no more wise none the wiser so the odd soul thing is supposed to represent that I feel like I'm weird from the inside out and it's kind of a permanent condition whatever that my my weirdness is uh, what's the word for 
uh, something, a medical condition that's, that's permanent, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. Whatever that word is, Whatever is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> terminal. terminal. Is it terminal or is that, yeah. Yeah. Terminal weirdness. <laughs> right on. Um, well, odd soul marks a lot of changes for you guys too. Um, yeah. It's definitely a different approach, I noticed. Um, what does the record mean to you? Well, it's certainly more about having fun than our previous record. I think it is more fun. It's also more, I think, biographical. There's a lot of moments that maybe you know, that I could point out and say that lyric comes from a specific story that we always tell each other and laugh about, or that's you know, all these things. Uh, and I think it's closer. I'm not satisfied with it. But I think it's closer to getting to that place that I want to be where I feel like the records we're making are the best records, my favorite. And I, I think that about halfway through making this record, I started to finally believe that it was okay to want to ignore any debilitating self-criticism or fear of what someone else might think about it and only pursue my own passion, my own favorite, like whatever excites me. And I've not believed that, I've been scared to, you know. So, um, here I say this, and then I, I, I think that on our next record, that's going to be my goal, is going to be to make myself love it. Like, make, make something that I love. Not make myself love it, but make something that I love. You know, like, I love everything about this. And I, I, love, I love this record more than anyone we've done before, but, um, and of course you always, you always like, like something and then you want to get better like you're never happy right but then there's this difference between that and um feeling like you're being scared right and so this is the least scared i've ever been because i, I feel like we we by not having a producer we allowed ourselves to trust our gut more you know and, and follow that but you still get worried you know you still get worried about losing all your fans and um you get worried about um you know, just making something that only you like. But I'm starting to believe that if I do the thing that gets me, the more excited I get, then the more value it will have, the more other people, there's more there for people to latch on to. Yeah. Right on. So, that's the hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your favorite song on the, on the record? I, I think it, it comes down to, I always like the slow songs. Of course, I love All or Nothing and In No Time. Um, Another favorite is Britannia, the second song on the record. For the reason of the fun. I think that's one of the most fun songs we've ever done. It's fun to play. Uh, so it, it comes down between those three. Those are my favorites. Right on. Yeah, Britannia is my favorite. It is? I love that song. Good, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, so changing it up a little bit, what's the best advice that you've been given? Oh, well, you'll have to at least narrow it down. Are we talking about life advice or specifically creative music I stuff? Say, I would say life. Whew. Um, well, oh my goodness, just the best advice I've ever been given. Yeah. Um, well, I had this weird experience whenever, this is the first thing that came to my mind. This might not be the best advice that was ever given to me at all, but this is the first thing that came to my mind, so I think... I was a waiter, I was 17 years old, I was working at a restaurant called Dancy's, and um, it was this small diner. I was the only male server, it was all women in their 40s, and then me, this high school kid, it was my first job, and it was late at night, and this one couple came in, and you know, it's a small town, so usually it's pretty, it's farmers and stuff. The guy had the silver spiky hair, very very 90s. It was 1999, so he had the right hair for his occupation. And the woman was gorgeous. She was wearing sweats. She had a t-shirt, baggy t-shirt, and sweatpants. But was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen, especially in Missouri. You know? And then this cute little two-year-old baby boy. And they sat in my section. And I just, I was really talkative, and, and I was prying, and I found out that she was a model for a, she was the cool water woman for Davidoff that mm -hmm. perfume she she was the cool water woman and he was the guitar player for the band called Filter you remember them oh, yeah. right yeah. <laughs> and they were the, and they were driving all the way up to Wisconsin and they were stopping in Marshfield and eating there in my section and I told him and I told him I said you're doing what I want to do this is 
my dream, yeah. And, he, and I said, is there anything you could say? And he's like, yeah, I have one thing that I feel like has always helped me. He said, I always try to pick up, I'm always trying to learn. He said, um, yeah, everything you'll go through, uh, will, some of it will seem like a big waste, but if you can take away one little thing from it and learn how to do this, if you're always learning, so it's, that's a pretty obvious one, always learn. But I think a lot of people do kind of, you know, it's pretty easy to just shut down and say, okay, I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to coast. So I do try to, I try to learn how to, uh, like for this tour, not to brag, but for this tour I had to learn how to do animation. We, we did these, we have these background videos and uh, the way that we were able to get it done in time was for one, to hire a bunch of people to make videos, but then I had to make four or five myself. And I did, I used, you know, so I'd never used that program After Effects before, but I just tried to dig into it. And um, so, and I thought about him, and I thought that probably was a, a sort of a, a moment that gave me a little bit of courage, you know, when I'm meeting him. And you know how you place too much uh, meaning in a moment? It might have just been coincidence. It probably wasn't. I mean, you know, they're stopping through, they random. But as a kid, you, you make it like, oh, yes, that's a sign, you know? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I took that, ran with it. <laughs> <laughs> right oh, but you know what? Another great one. I love Carl Sandburg, that poet saying, I was either going to be a writer or a bum. That's one of my favorites, too. I, I think that's another great advice, is the one of no safety net. And that's that's one I'm, I firmly believe in, too. Like, set yourself up to uh, be really screwed if... Your, if your goal doesn't work out so that way you really go for it, right? Not yeah, like halfway, that. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you've been a part of Mute Math for about 10 years now. Yeah, huh? Crazy, right? <laughs> I know. Um, I would love to hear what you've learned about yourself, just having toured with these guys and being, you know, going through the music business and the ups and downs of it. Hmm. Well, I, I know that I'm not naturally disposed towards... Like, I, I'm more of that uh, flighty, creative type who wants to make stuff and doesn't necessarily give himself a, a specific goal or p push forward to a thing. And then Paul's very, you know, uh, goal-oriented. He's much more driven and much more, you know... And so all through my 10 years now working in Mute Math, I've become more like him. You know, I'm always, I'm always trying to... I'm, I'm always the younger one, and I'm trying to impress them, trying to keep up with them, right? So I've learned a little something about hard work. Like, I, I've learned that worry is solved by work. That's one thing I've learned, is that a lot of the problems I've had, or, or problems we've had in the band, or things that we'll, that we'll just toil over, that the real solution is to burrow down and to do hard work, and then, and then, and then your problem is solved. It's really just that you got to chop that tree down you gotta you gotta go to work um and i've learned something about the value of rest because i've sometimes pushed myself too far and then crashed and the crash costs way more than a good break would have you know it's way more you get way less done at, because of the crash you know so you push yourself for a little bit and you feel like you're i'm doing so much and then yeah. you just you know you're, you're sick and debilitated and yeah like I am right now I suppose uh, you're getting better though <laughs> getting better getting better and um and I've, I've learned I think I've unlearned and then and I'm trying to relearn some things that I knew whenever we first started out like I had a lot of really lofty childlike ideals going into it. I think that was something that Paul was attracted to in me was that I saw everything as this really exciting, fun opportunity, and it was all new, and he was never satisfied. It was never good enough, and I was always freaking out about how incredible every like we're getting to play. Like it didn't take much. We're gonna play a concert, <laughs> yeah. Like, um, and, and so there was this good blend there, this good blend of optimism and pessimism, like pragmatic and and then really uh, pie in the sky. That we I think we balanced each other out well. Um, and then sometimes as I get older, I get a little bit more cantankerous and, and then I have to re remember to try and be more like I was when I was a kid. And something that helps with that is whenever, like we have a guy in the crew right now who's only 20 
And just having someone that age around helps me remember how grateful I should be and what a cool thing this is and how much fun it's supposed to be and all that and how I need to chill out, yeah. you know, all that. Um, but the real thing, getting married, that's what taught me a lot. That's that's where, like, real self-discovery started happening. That's whenever I started to realize, well, I'm a... I'm rotten. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not as. I'm not as awesome as I thought I was. I didn't know I could be so whiny, you know. Yeah. Or uh, selfish, or. Uh, you know, or pitiful. So that that in my now a year and eight months into marriage, I've. I, I, don't, I don't think anything holds a mirror up to you quite like except for, you know, my bandmates talk about how they th- you, they say yeah you think marriage does that and then having a kid really shows you you think you're not selfish you think that marriage cured you until you have a kid and then you really you that really tests you and I watch them and they're doing a good job yeah well I won't keep you too long um, but one last question sure you guys have influenced countless numbers of bands. Um, I would love to hear some bands that have influenced you. Uh, I I love music, so I'm always hunting. That's my favorite thing to do. Is so I you know, I try to grab a little something from everyone. And I can remember every night there are little like fills that I do, and whenever I do them, I think about the time that I saw the drummer do that, and I took it from him. You know. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget that one. Anymore. And there's little, you know, just groups I've seen along the way, some of them that aren't even bands anymore. But of the real ones that really inspired me, there was this drummer whenever I was a kid named Gene Krupa, and he was my hero. He's my drum hero. He played for Benny Goodman. He's the one who legendarily got people to dance in the in the aisles at Carnegie Hall whenever they played Sing Sing Sing. You know that. Uh, ba-dum, bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Uh, and he was, I really thought he was cool. And I, I play a four piece kit because that's what he played. He played a smaller kit. Quest Love for the Roots is and will forever be, no matter what or where he's playing, one of my favorites of all time. Um, but as far as bands, bands, bands go, then there's also Radiohead, Bjork, Beastie Boys, Beach Boys, um, James Brown. Is was my favorite of all time, and I and I as I'm saying these, I feel actually guilt because I think about how good those those acts are, and I think about how if you're going to list those as your influences, you had better be great. You know, it used to piss me off whenever someone would hand me a demo and say, "Yeah, we sound like Portishead," and I put it in, and it's really bad. And like, this is, you just you need to stop saying that you think you sound like Portishead. Um, so I want to be careful. I mean, those are my aspirations is to be as good as those groups I just mentioned one day. Um, and I, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that we do well and I'm really proud of. But um, I'm trying really hard. I've been trying really hard lately to accurately assess well, how good are we? You know, how, how are we doing? Are we, you know, what are we good at and what are we not right now? Because it's, it's so easy to just get high on the fact that you're doing it. Like, ah, I made that beat. I did that. I made that song. But if you think about it sometimes as a person who has no connection to it, you might have passed on it. You might have not been that impressed. It's always a weird thing whenever you're real young and you think you just made this and you show it to somebody and you realize you hear it differently for the first time whenever you hear it with them and you realize, oh, <laughs> I guess it's not, I guess I didn't invent music just now. <laughs> yeah, just pick out all the flaws. Yeah, 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 yeah. So those are some of my favorites. Of course, Paul grew up loving Sting and, and, um, I know earlier on his voice sounded more like Sting, and now it's become more his own thing. Of course, we love Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles. And um, more recently, I thought I, I, I think that Jack White's really special. <laughs> I think he's really incredible, and um, I, could, I could keep going. I could go forever. You know, this is what I talk. I, the record shopping is what I talk about. That's what I like. Um, you know, and anything with synthesizers in it, I usually get pretty sucked on it. DJ Shadow was a big one for me because that was when I started using a sampler. It was after hearing him. And that's how I make a lot of my music because I, I build it out of samples and stuff like that. So that was a big influence as well. Um, but it, I guess if I'm if I'm going to be kind of stranded on a desert island, it's going to be Bjork, DJ Shadow, um, Radiohead, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. I guess we'll wrap it up. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Honored.